Uh, I don't know if Dr. Braverman doesn't probably know, remember this, but he actually introduced me to my first patient with Graves' disease 40 years ago, about five miles from here, down at Tufts Medical School. He was a professor, and I was a second-year medical student in 1972. You brought a patient with Graves' disease on the stage, and you uh, actually talked after she uh, left, you talked about the therapies, and they're exactly the same therapies from 40 years ago. We haven't had anything new. Uh, Dr. Smith hasn't figured out how to get rid of the antibody, so basically we end up getting rid of your thyroid gland. Is, uh, so this talk is titled, The Treatment Really of Iatrogenic Hypothyroidism. The definition of iatrogenesis is, iatros is physician, so this is physician-induced. So when we normally, iatrogenesis is sort of a pejorative. It, usually we refer to it as something that's unintentional. But as Dr. Braverman pointed out, that some of these therapies, for example, total thyroidectomy, intentionally induce an underfunctioning thyroid. So all treatment options for Graves' disease, for the hyperthyroid state of Graves' disease, induce hypothyroidism. And I have a formal um, PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I'd like to keep it as informal as Dr. Braverman kept it. So if you have questions on these slides, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll take the questions as we go along. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Braven pointed out, surgical thyroidectomy, we have new guidelines that were just published um, in our major thyroid journal, Thyroid, back in June. Hyperthyroidism and other causes of thyrotoxicosis management guidelines. These are put out by the American Thyroid Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. And recommendation 24 is that if you choose surgery, as the primary therapy, you should really have a near total and, or a total thyroidectomy, as Dr. Braverman uh, pointed out. Uh, one reason would be to limit the risk of developing Graves' orbitopathy following the surgery. That's sort of a clinical um, pearl that uh, we feel is probably reality. Um, also, if you do not have a total thyroidectomy, you are likely to not be cured. You're likely to not be cured. And surgeons in the past had, in my experience, much greater skill at leaving behind just the right amount of thyroid tissue to keep somebody from needing to take thyroid hormone replacement for an underfunctioning thyroid. Uh, but today, most surgeons are more skilled at doing what are called extracapsular uh, total thyroidectomy. And um, it's considered almost as safe an operation as leaving behind small amounts of thyroid tissue. And again, the goal is to render the patient hypothyroid uh, nearly 100% of the time. Me, yeah. The well, uh, the surgical, you, you, you want to be uh, operated on if you choose surgery by a surgeon skilled at identifying the parathyroid glands to leave them in place uh, so that you do not develop an underfunctioning parathyroid problem. And that, that, complication of total thyroidectomy is significantly higher in surgeons who perform this operation less frequently. And unfortunately, in my experience, and I think there's literature to this effect, it's higher even in skilled surgeons' hands when they're operating on patients with Graves' disease as opposed to nodular thyroid disease, thyroid cancer. And maybe that has to do with the vascularity of the gland. So prior to surgery, Patients are pre-treated with antithyroid drugs and Dr. Wood's old therapy, iodine, because iodine reduces the vascularity of the thyroid gland and makes the operation safer. But the risk of developing an underfunctioning parathyroid problem is still substantial uh, when these surgeons operate on Graves' disease, which is why I think it's not considered really the treatment of choice for the usual patient with Graves' disease. The parathyroid glands are four much smaller glands about the size of your pinky uh, nail uh, that sit behind the thyroid on either side, which is why they're called parathyroid glands. And they really have nothing to do with the thyroid gland. They just live in the neighborhood. And when they were discovered four or 500 years ago, nobody knew their function, so they called them parathyroid glands. Their function, it turns out, is to control the calcium level in our blood. Nothing to do with the thyroid. The parathyroid glands make parathyroid hormone in response to a drop in your blood calcium level. 
the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone. And so if you do develop an underfunctioning parathyroid inadvertently as a complication of total thyroidectomy, uh, that needs to be treated with calcium and vitamin D because we really don't have parathyroid hormone. Well, we have it, but it's not really standard of care to replace somebody with parathyroid hormone. It's not a tablet. It's an injectable. And it's not standard of care to replace somebody with parathyroid hormone as we replace somebody with thyroid hormone for an underfunctioning thyroid. So it's, you'd like to avert the problem, uh, but it's still a treatable uh, condition. Um, as is the 100% the complication of doing a total thyroidectomy, which is an underactive thyroid. And there were data just published a few months ago that this should also be considered the treatment of choice. If you choose surgery in children and adolescents, uh, we should probably also be considering total or near total thyroidectomy uh, since subtotal is associated with a higher risk of uh, not curing the patient permanently. Likewise, our current guidelines recommend that if you choose radioactive iodine, that, be, that it be administered in a dose designed to render you hypothyroid, designed to cause hypothyroidism. That is now considered the actual goal of the treatment, not just curing the overfunctioning thyroid and leaving the patient with normal thyroid function, but the goal of the therapy is really to cause hypothyroidism. That's what the guidelines uh, currently recommend. Now, we talked a little bit about antithyroid drugs, and the guidelines recommend uh, not using block and replace therapy. In other words, um, using uh, block and replace therapy again is when you use an antithyroid drug, you overtreat, deliberately overtreat, to render the patient hypothyroid, to cause a low thyroid level in the blood, and then you add back thyroid hormone to, keep the th to bring the thyroid level back to normal. And so that is called block it down, block it, and replace it, or add back treatment. And the guidelines recommend not doing that because of a, a literature analysis that says uh, that you typically will end up needing higher doses of antithyroid drug in that circumstance um, to cause the hypothyroidism and then add back the levothyroxine. And that leads to higher risk of side effect of the antithyroid drug. On the other side of the coin, uh, there were data, as Dr. Braverman mentioned, that are open to question and probably not true, uh, the pr that block and replace therapy increases chances of staying in remission after the antithyroid drug is stopped. So by convention, and also in the guidelines, when we treat and if overfunctioning thyroid, when we treat a patient with an overfunctioning thyroid with an antithyroid drug, we try to achieve normal thyroid levels. And after about 12, 18, or 24 months, uh, if your thyroid function is perfectly normal, we try stopping the antithyroid drug because a certain percentage of patients are in remission, their antibody levels are gone, and they don't need the drug to block their thyroid from working any longer. And the initial data on block and replace therapy was really the impetus for this approach uh, was to try to increase chances of staying in remission. And there were data from not in the United States that this worked, some of it from China. Uh, some of the original work was done in China. And when American thyroidologists tried to reproduce this data, these, th this uh, result, uh, they were unsuccessful. Uh, so it's now considered unlikely that block and replace therapy increases your chances of staying in remission permanently after stopping the drug. And just anecdotally, I personally have seen uh, one patient who was uh, treated with antithyroid drugs in the early 1960s, and, I, and she was fine until 2001 and relapsed 40 years later. So she, you're never really completely out of the woods. Now, on the other side of the coin, as Dr. Braverman said, according to guidelines, we really shouldn't be using block and replace therapy for the majority of people. But in my practice, if I'm having difficulty achieving a stable, normal thyroid state, what we call euthyroidism, achieving a stable, normal thyroid state, 
they're on 15 milligrams and that's too much, and we drop it down to 10 milligrams and that's still too much, so we drop it down to 5 milligrams and they relapse, and you go up to 10 milligrams and now they're back to low, and they're on that low a dose, it's actually easier for the patient to actually stay on a hypothyroid dose of the antithyroid drug and add back the levothyroxine, not because we're trying to raise chances of remission, just for the ease of administration. Just to, It's easier sometimes to establish a steady, normal thyroid level by blocking it down, sure, at the risk of using a few extra milligrams of the antithyroid drug, but most of my, in my practice, most of these patients are on very low-dose therapy. I have very few patients who, who actually relapse when, they're, when their methimazole dose is lower to 2.5 milligrams and 5 milligrams is too much. So it makes sense to me to leave that patient on 5 milligrams and add back thyroid hormone, and then it's often and most of the time quite steady. So it's actually excellent therapy. And I'm going to, I don't audit my practice. I see a lot of people with Graves' disease over the past 40 years. I've seen thousands of patients with Graves' disease. And in my practice right now, I would guess that about 25% of patients who choose antithyroid drug treatment are being treated with block and replace. Again, not to raise their chances of staying in remission, but just ease of establishing a normal thyroid state. Uh, when we use... Uh, when, we, when we deliberately are using antithyroid drugs in a block and replace or add back fashion, um, we know that 100%, that's the purpose, is to make the patient hypothyroid. When we do surgical total thyroidectomy, virtually 100% of patients develop hypothyroidism, and the goal of radioactive iodine therapy is also to achieve hypothyroidism, and it does in nearly... 100% of patients. If you lowball the dose of radioactive iodine to try to leave the patient normal, you'll end up having to retreat a substantial proportion of patients. So I agree with the goal. Yes? Uh, yeah, let me address that. Yeah. So uh, that's a great point. Uh, when you take the thyroid out surgically, 100%, it's gone. You, can't, you don't have any production of thyroid hormone left in your body. Uh, but when you destroy the thyroid with radioactive iodine, first of all, it's a much slower boat. It takes a while, which we'll get into the time course after radioactive iodine, and when you develop an underfunctioning thyroid, you still have some thyroid function, and you have autonomy of thyroid function. So if, if I, for example, have a normal thyroid, and I gave myself a full replacement dose of thyroid hormone, my thyroid would just shut down, and the only thyroid in my body would be the thyroid hormone I'm taking. When somebody is treated with radioactive iodine, and we do not always cause hypothyroidism, but we usually cause hypothyroidism, sometimes the hypothyroidism is profound, as if we've taken the thyroid out surgically, but often it's less severe, and in those patients, um, that can worsen over time. So eventually, in many patients, while at the onset of the underfunctioning thyroid, it's not as severe as if we've removed the thyroid surgically, gradually over time, it often becomes that severe. Say again? If the thyroid burns out naturally under natural radiation, radioactivity or stress and all that. No, natural radiation, natural sources of radiation, is that what you. No, no, I'm thinking metaphorically. Oh. And rushing, you know, living in New York, for example. I had high stress five years ago. Yes. Yes. Well, str yeah, there's no question, um, you know, just based on patients telling us this, uh, that stressful life events precipitate Graves' hyperthyroidism. So presumably stressful life events precipitate 
the B lymphocyte production of the antibodies that Dr. Smith was telling us about. Uh, in my practice, I hear that about 10% of the time. Now, does stress then, can stress also induce blocking antibodies that then block the thyroid down? I don't know. That I don't hear in my practice. Yes. Well, there are people, there are, you know, a few percent of patients with autoimmune thyroid disease who flip back and forth from overfunctioning thyroid to an underfunctioning thyroid and sometimes back to an overfunctioning thyroid, not burnt out, like you're referring to. Yes. Well, there's two reasons why somebody with autoimmune thyroid disease develops an underfunctioning thyroid. One, the antibodies have destroyed the thyroid. That I would refer to as burnt out. But two, which is often the case in people who initially present with Graves' disease and overproducing thyroid, in those patients, presumably the mix of antibodies when they have an overproducing thyroid is on the side of stimulatory antibodies. And then when they develop an underfunctioning thyroid, the mix of antibodies is such that they block the thyroid from producing. And I know this is the case because those patients can then flip back to an overfunctioning thyroid. So clearly the antibodies haven't caused burnt out hypothyroidism, permanently low thyroid function. Uh, those antibodies glom onto the receptor on the thyroid cell and block the natural TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, from telling that thyroid gland to work. And those antibodies can again disappear. And if you have stimulatory antibodies, you're back to having an overfunctioning thyroid. Yeah. I'm not clear. Phrase it again. Well, let me stop. Let me stop you right there. Because I actually don't like these terms. Graves' disease is an overfunctioning thyroid. Hashimoto's disease is an underfunctioning thyroid. But since we see people who can flip from an overfunctioning to an underfunctioning, I actually prefer in my practice in explaining it to patients. Uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and to this audience, I'd like to, pr I prefer to call it autoimmune thyroid disease. And depending on that day, that year, that month, what, what's the mix of antibodies you happen, you have autoimmune thyroid disease, you're making antibodies to your thyroid. Sometimes you're making purely stimulatory antibodies. Sometimes you're making a mix of stimulatory and blocking antibodies. And those patients can actually have normal thyroid function, but still have plenty of antibodies in their blood. And then sometimes you're making purely blocking antibodies or a mix that le you know, leads your thyroid to underfunction. So it's all autoimmune thyroid disease. And by convention, since Graves described the overfunctioning thyroid, we call that Graves' disease. And since Hashimoto in the early 1900s described an underfunctioning thyroid, we call that Hashimoto's disease. But basically, they're the same disease, just two ends of the spectrum. Now, we're going to hear more, I think, later today or tomorrow about how radioactive iodine works, but just briefly, it's, you swallow it, it's absorbed, and it goes into your thyroid cells within 30 seconds, and each cell sucks up a, the radioactive iodine molecule just because it's iodine, and the cells have a capacity to uh, concentrate iodine, thyroid cells, like no other cell in our body. And so each uh, cell is then individually destroyed as it goes to divide but it takes weeks to months for that to occur. Correct? <laughs> no? <laughs> Correct me if I'm... <laughs> and you too, Dr. Braverman, if I say something wrong, you know, you're the professor. Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm quoting Doug Ross. Now, Doug Ross is an endocrinologist who works at the Mass General down the road, just down Starrow Drive here. And we, uh, he wrote the chapter in this um, online textbook called up-to-date that a lot of us access 
for up-to-date information. And this topic, he last updated Dr. Ross just a few months ago. And what he said uh, subsequently, or maybe it was, all right, so he's right. It takes six to 18 weeks on average. And so you can see it's kind of a slow, slow response. Yeah. Yeah, so I can address that, but probably it's better addressed by a subsequent speaker. But um, that's called radio resistance. There are some folks who resist the treatment. How many? In my practice, a few percent. There are three, four, five percent of people who you administer a standard dose, like Dr. Ross says, 10 or 15 millicuries. That's a way we measure radioactive iodine and yet it does not destroy the thyroid gland adequately or doesn't destroy enough of the thyroid gland. And so a second and rarely a third dose is needed. How many people need a third dose? You're one in maybe a thousand, okay, because 95% of people are successfully treated with one dose and the 5% of people who resist that dose, 95% of those people are successfully treated with a second dose. So it's very uncommon or rare to actually need a third dose. Uh, so some people don't respond. These responses are average. So this is sort of an average response, uh, but everybody's different. I've never seen two patients with Graves' disease who are alike, including identical twins. You can have an identical twin who presents with stimulatory antibodies, and your twin has blocking antibodies, and they have an underfunctioning thyroid, and you've got the overfunctioning thyroid. And there are literally, literally no two people alike who have Graves' disease. And, there are no, and everybody responds differently to these, to these interventions. So we have to be individualizing this therapy. Just on that topic, and back to what Dr. Wood said, one sort of trick of the trade that's old and forgotten I'm sure Dr. Wood and Braverman remember it, is if, you've been if your first dose of radioactive iodine has not worked adequately, but it has worked somewhat, if you then add iodine, not radioactive iodine, just what Dr. Wood was referring to, stable iodine in large dose, that will continue to cause the thyroid to underfunction. And it's block and replace because it's impossible to adjust or titrate or adjust the dose of iodine to get the level perfect. So in that situation, one or two doses of radioactive iodine, one trick of the trade is then to not give a third dose of radioactive iodine, but to give stable iodine. That will most of the time cause an underfunctioning thyroid, block it down with iodine like you would with an antithyroid drug, and then you're added back the, the therapy for the underfunctioning thyroid, which we'll be talking about. But just on average, and this is, you know, most, most people in this situation do respond typically this way. Uh, the thyroid function begins to fall several weeks after the radioactive iodine is administered, and usually by about two to three months, you're heading low. Now, in another chapter on up-to-date, the uh, time course is such that we typically measure thyroid function six weeks after the treatment because they are very rapid responders. So some people develop, they're close to developing an underfunctioning thyroid six weeks after the treatment. That's a relatively rapid response. So you don't want to miss those people. Um, uh, this author feels that uh, we should then do it every six weeks until you develop an underfunctioning thyroid and then treat. And that is not my practice because if you do it that way, uh, you'll end up with a certain proportion of patients suffering from the symptoms of an underfunctioning thyroid. Now, again, no two patients are alike. And, for example, in patients who have um, total thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer, we often give 
radioactive iodine to destroy every single cancer cell that the surgeon has left behind. And in order to get that accomplished, the patient has to be, has to have an underfunctioning thyroid. And I would estimate that 50% of my patients who are withdrawn from thyroid hormone for a good month in order to undergo that therapy feel perfectly fine. But 50% of patients don't. So in order to protect those patients from developing symptoms of an underactive thyroid, I think we should be a little more proactive uh, because we don't want patients coming in complaining of these symptoms. We want to try to prevent this from happening to people. These are some of the symptoms. It, a lot of the symptoms have to, be, have to do with slowing of metabolic processes. You start feeling cold, you're fatigued, the GI tract slows, you're constipated. Muscle cramps is often a prominent symptom of severe hypothyroidism early on and cognitive dysfunction. In fact, I got a call from the emergency room last night about an elderly woman who was in the emergency room who had uh, lost access to her thyroid hormone tablets a few weeks ago and was severely hypothyroid and was hallucinating to the point where they were going to be putting her on the psychiatric ward. A rare complication of an underfunctioning thyroid, we call it myxedema madness. But milder states of hypothyroidism can cause, you know, thinking difficulties. Yeah. Apps, I can't agree with you more. Yeah, and it speaks to the importance of screening patients for underfunctioning thyroid who have complaints that might be very nonspecific but suggestive of an underfunctioning thyroid. It's a simple, easy, very sensitive and specific blood test that's not expensive. So before anybody is diagnosed with any psychiatric disease, in my opinion, maybe it's self-serving, because I'm an endocrinologist, but I think they deserve thyroid function testing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Right. That's right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. You can have both. Yeah. It's like Dr. Marcus, a bone expert, told me two days ago at a lecture that one of his mentors, a famous bone specialist, Dr. Auerbach, said to him once, you can have fleas and you can have lice. Just having fleas doesn't mean you can't get lice on top of it. Just told me that two days. <laughs> uh, signs of an underfunctioning thyroid, you're slowed, and your heart rate slows. Now, on the other side of the coin, contrary to popular belief, it's really a misconception that an underfunctioning thyroid causes severe weight gain or obesity or overweight. You do gain weight, but it's modest weight gain. Some of the weight is due to a slowing of metabolic rate, but in my opinion, uh, based on seeing you know, many, many patients who developed hypothyroidism, I think the majority of the weight gain has to do with fluid accumulation and so-called non-pitting edema. I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor and he'll press on your lower leg. Why would he be pressing? He's looking for pitting edema. He's looking for swelling that he can, put his, that he can put a dent into, and that's called pitting edema. But the peculiar thing about the swelling that you get in hypothyroidism, an underfunctioning thyroid state, is that it does not pit, which often leads doctors to miss the problem. You feel swollen, you look swollen, but when he goes to find pitting edema, he won't find it because he's pressing on a sponge that comes right back. And the reason it's a sponge is because your skin accumulates these um, substances called glycosaminoglycans. And maybe some of you are taking by mouth a glycosaminoglycan in the form of chondroitin, which is a glyco gly gly glycosaminoglycan, and glucosamine is just a precursor. So I know a lot of you probably, how many are on glucosamine for their arthritis? Yeah? All right, well, you are taking glycosaminoglycans. And these um, substances tend to uh, they're, they're normal substances 
in synovial fluid and joint fluid, the normal components of connective tissues, cartilage, and tendon, and they tend to accumulate in states of underfunctioning thyroid. You can even make glycosaminoglycans into artificial skin, and here's an electron micrograph of a artificial skin, and you can see it looks kind of spongy, and it has this property of being able to bind water, so it, 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 it swells, but it doesn't pit. Okay, so let's not confuse pretibial myxedema with myxedema. So this is a confusing thing. Um, we, uh, this is actually, and I have this in a later slide, this is myxedema, but it is not pretibial myxedema. They're entirely different conditions. What we call um, myxedema is this swelling that you would get all over your body from accumulation of glycosaminoglycans and fluid coming into these substances. Pretibial myxedema, it's an unfortunate term, Terry referred to it as pretibial dermopathy, prefer that term, is a rash. Okay, it has nothing to do with the myxedema I'm talking about from an underfunctioning thyroid. Is that, is that, no? It's the same stuff. It's the same stuff, but... Different. And would the edema be pitting if it's no. not? It's not in both, cases. in both cases. Okay. In both cases. It causes this um, facial appearance that you'll see in patients with relatively severe hypothyroidism. This is uh, the before picture, before treatment of the hypothyroidism. You can see this puffiness to her face, this sort of swelling around her eyes. And, and again, this is. So this is myxedematous facial appearance, different from the dermopathy that Dr. Smith's referring to. You can also get flu fluid accumulation in body cavities, such as the uh, chest. Here's an example of a uh, chest x-ray from a hypothyroid patient where there's uh, fluid accumulation in the right between the lung and the chest wall, so the so-called pleural space. Uh, uh, you can also get accumulation in the heart. This patient probably has a little bit of fluid around the heart because that's very common. It's a very common finding if you look for it. Uh, but sometimes it can get fairly severe, like in this patient where you see the red arrows. Um, there's a pericardium, a covering of the heart, and there's a little bit of fluid between the covering of the heart and the heart muscle itself. And you can see that this is quite expanded and you can see how large the heart is in patients with um, uh, pericardial effusion from an underfunctioning thyroid. You can start seeing elevated cholesterol. And so if you have an elevated cholesterol, you might want to ask your doctor to check and make sure that it's not elevated because you have an underfunctioning thyroid, particularly if you have a history of Graves' disease and treatment for Graves' disease. It really affects every organ, because thyroid hormone goes everywhere and affects every cell, practically speaking. And it causes nonspecific complaints. Joint pain, a lot of people have joint pain, might have nothing to do with their thyroid, muscle pain, sort of a pins and needles sensation, heavy menstrual flow, opposite of the light menstrual flow that you get with the overproducing thyroid. Hyperthyroidism, as Terry pointed out, causes light menstrual flow, you get heavier menstrual flow. Peculiarly, you get this decreased hearing when you're rendered severely hypothyroid, and you can get a lot of scalp hair loss. Here's an example of that. And this is one of the, I think this might have been the second patient ever treated, ever treated with thyroid hormone. And you can see this dramatic, you know, uh, lessening of her scalp hair loss. This patient was treated by Dr. Murray, an English physician, uh, back in 1891 or 92, who first described treatment of myxedema, hypothyroidism, uh, and published, I think, that particular woman uh, 28 years later. And that treatment uh, consisted of 
extracted thyroid, animal thyroid extract. And it was such a dramatic response that he got from his first few patients that it was widely adopted quite rapidly. Is that right? But it was sheep. It was sheep, yeah. So here he is, uh, Dr. Murray, who pioneered the treatment of uh, endocrine disorders, specifically hypothyroidism. Now, he was, he, was, um, he was standing on the shoulders of others, other scientists who had already described patients who developed hypothyroidism from Hashimoto's disease um, and so-called myxedema. And then he came along in 1891 and wrote a note on the treatment of myxedema by actually uh, injecting extracts of sheep thyroid. Now, um, so it, as I said, it became widely adopted. Now it's not sheep. Now it's either cows or pigs, mostly pig. And the glands are dried, ground to a powder, powder bound up with chemicals, pressed into pills. And it was a new use for parts of uh, animals that were really discarded in the past. And so Armour and Company, they were the dominant meat packer in the 20th century, and that's how we got Armour thyroid extract from a meat packer. It's now made by a uh, you know, pharmaceutical company, and there are many other brands around the world of, armor, of uh, thyroid extract from mostly pig, I think, is what they use these days, and not bovine or cow. Now, replacement by thyroid extract in underfunctioning thyroid was one of the most effective treatments of any disease available. It was quite dramatic, and so it became widely adopted, and um, it relieved the symptoms in the majority of people. It turns out that what um, the, the, other, the next advance in treating patients with an underfunctioning thyroid was figuring out, well, what was the component in there that was actually helping the patient. And Kendall isolated uh, thyroxin from uh, animal thyroid in 1915. Here's Dr. Kendall, who actually was a Nobel Prize winner for his work on the adrenal gland, <coughs> hormones of the adrenal gland, but he didn't just focus on adrenal hormones. He was the discoverer of thyroxin. And then it took another 35, 40 years for the laboratory of Rosalind Pitt Rivers to uh, find a second form of thyroid hormone that is actually the more physiologic active form of the hormone called T3. Thyroxin is T4, and uh, liothyronine or triiodothyronine that Dr. Pitt Rivers and her postdoc fellow Dr. Gross discovered is called T3 simply because T4 has four iodine molecules and T3 has lost in iodine, and that's what makes it biologically active, and that's why we call it T3. Now, by the 1960s, it was known that it was really the thyroxin that was the essential hormone produced by the thyroid gland, and that the T3 was being manufactured in your tissues. There was very little T3 coming out of your thyroid. So it's an inertial system. We make the pro-hormone. We make mostly the inactive form of the hormone. And then our tissues, our heart, our liver, our lungs, our body tissues, then have the capacity, each individual tissue, to remove the iodine as it's needed in order to make a functioning form of thyroid hormone. And so it turns out that if you just replace somebody with thyroxin, you get as good a benefit, we think, as replacing somebody with both thyroxin and T3 contained in thyroid extract. And so again, our thyroid glands do make some T3, uh, but about, a, about 95%, 98% of what we make is T4, and a little bit of it is T3, but the majority of the T3 is made from the T4 in each individual tissue. So the secretion rate of T4 is 56 micrograms per meter squared, and the T3 secretion rate is 3. Now, when you take armor thyroid extract or any porcine thyroid extract or any animal extract, you're getting a mixture of T4 and T3, and it is not the human proportion. It is not 56 to 3. It's more like 
And that's a bit of a problem for a minority of patients because when they, when you, we now know how to measure T4 and T3 in blood, and when we measure T3 soon after you take the extracted, which contains T3 and T4, uh, you can see that the T4 level in yellow is quite steady, but for a few hours after taking the T3, you produce levels in your blood that are elevated. And a minority of patients feel it. They feel like they have their over-functioning thyroid back for a few hours a day after taking T3. Some of them like it, but most of them are distressed by it. Um, and some patients, even on the proper dose of thyroid extract, still have these nonspecific complaints, fatigue, weight gain, other nonspecific type symptoms. So desiccated thyroid hormones began to be replaced in the 1960s by um, pharmaceutical um, manufacturers with synthetic products. And by the 1980s, most patients are at that point being prescribed synthetic levothyroxine or combinations of synthetic levothyroxine and synthetic triiodothyronine or liothyronine rather than thyroid extract. And it was for several reasons uh, that that occurred. One of them was that the chemists, you know, figured out uh, these active molecules like thyroxine and figured out how to synthesize them. It would be more pure. The dose would be more controlled. And so in that context, it was Easy, it was easy for these drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, to market this stuff as being superior to the animal thyroid. And Synthroid then became, it was like, you know, tissues were Kleenex and photocopy machines were Xerox machines and levothyroxine was Synthroid and people still refer to Synthroid when they really are talking about uh, levothyroxine. And that was the first um, branded levothyroxine product on the market. And it probably did have better dose precision. Uh, there was a 1980 paper, which I don't think has been replicated, uh, looking at the hormone content of, arm, of, of thyroid extract pills. And because it's an extract, the hormone content varied. Now, if you take a 100 microgram tablet of levothyroxine and you crush it and extract the levothyroxine, it's going to be 100 micrograms. It's going to be 99 micrograms, 100 white micrograms. It's going to be exact. And we sometimes adjust these doses by a pill a month, by 3%, 4%, and that will make a difference in the blood test. And so it was often hard to achieve a steady level with extracted products because of these potential for variability in lot to lot. So if you go to the pharmacy one month, you might get a different lot than you'll get the next month, and the hormone content might be a little different. Now, dosing until the 60s was really a trial and error approach. It was really based on how people felt. And we got into a lot of trouble by over-treating people in that way. And then we began to measure things. We began to measure thyroid hormones in blood. And so these are the typical reference ranges. And you can see, unfortunately, the reference ranges are fairly wide. So if you take a dose of thyroid hormone that produces a T4 level of five, that could be less than half of what you actually need for you yourself. Could be right for some people, but it could be wrong for you. On the other hand, if you take a dose that raises your level to 12, that could be too much for you. That might be the right amount. So these reference ranges are fairly wide. That's a problem. And then along comes Dr. Utiger. And this is about five years after the discovery of radioimmunoassay, a, a new way of measuring things in blood and other body fluids. And he was able to measure human thyrotropin. And that's the hormone or the tropin that's produced by the pituitary that Terry was telling us about that causes the release of thyroid hormone. And just to quickly review, there's the pituitary gland on a, on a radiologic image, circled in red. It's a very small organ. So if you draw a line here and a line here where they intersect, that's where the pituitary sits. It sits in this little bony crevice called the cella. Uh, and the front part of it, called the anterior pituitary, produces several different hormones that are tropic hormones. One of them is thyrotropin, and that's the one that stimulates the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. And thyrotropin is otherwise known as thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH. And so this became a great boon to thyroidologists in terms of monitoring therapy. And the reason it's a great boon is because of this curve. 
um, the relationship between the thyroid level and the TSH level is very steep. It's called a log linear relationship, which means that for every one change in your thyroid level, you get a tenfold change in your TSH level. So that makes this test very, very sensitive to slight changes in the thyroid level. So if you take a bunch of women, or men, this study happens to be only done in women, and you measure their serum TSH or their serum thyrotropin, and you can see that there's a very tight normal range between 0.5 and 4, and almost all women have, who have an underfunctioning thyroid will have an elevated TSH above 4. Yes, there is a little overlap in the 3 to 4 to 5 range, uh, but it makes, it's a very sensitive test because there's very little overlap, and it's also very specific because if it's elevated, it's nearly 100% certain that you have an underfunctioning thyroid. There are other rare causes of an elevated TSH, but the vast, vast majority is because you've developed an underfunctioning thyroid. And so this became the test of choice in figuring out whether somebody is on the right amount of thyroid hormone because the assumption was that if we're making the pituitary gland happy, we're probably making the rest of your body happy. Now that may or may not be true, but we think it's true. On the other side of the coin, even that range, 0.5 to 4, is too wide to really judge what's right for every individual patient. Because if you're born to be a 1, you should never develop a 4. If you're born to have a TSH of 1, these are individual people. Patient 7, 12, for example. Patient 6, if you measure that patient's TSH level year after year after year, and it's around 1, it's always going to be around 1. If one year it's 3.5, which is still in the normal range, that is abnormal for that particular individual, and that means that that patient has an underfunctioning thyroid. So even that reference range is a little too wide to judge the effectiveness of e for each individual patient. Yeah? The reference range you're looking at is based on taking hundreds of people, presumably normal, sometimes they've been examined in a way to exclude autoimmune thyroid disease, and that's a problem because if they don't, and because the prevalence of autoimmune thyroid disease is so high that if you just take the next hundred women or men walking down the road, especially women, uh, you're going to find that five or ten of them have autoimmune thyroid disease unbeknownst to them. So they capture those patients. So you have to try to exclude those people. And if you exclude those people, you still get this reference range of about 0.5 to 4.5 for adults that are average age of the people in this audience. Yeah. But before you develop, if you ever had a screening TSH level when you were 22 years old and it was 1.0 and 10 years down the road, you had a, another screening TSH level and it was 4.0, that is not normal for you, even though that's normal for some people. That's my point. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And often you don't know what your pre-existing, you get disease, you get Graves' disease, and often there's no lab data from years before you had Graves' disease to know what your individual TSH level should be. Yeah. It is not. It is not. Yeah. Well, given the prevalence of, of autoimmune thyroid disease, you could make a strong case for screening healthy people. Right. Yeah, you can. But that's not done. Why not especially, that's my Can't answer your question. I don't know. 
I'm a practicing endocrinologist. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. So, as Dr. Wood said, if you have a family history, you can make the request, and your doctor will probably do it. You know, I think there's still a home, there's a TSH kit that you can buy and do a home TSH level. You don't actually have to go to the laboratory. Yeah. I, I don't know. There are, you know, there's, uh, I think it is becoming standard procedure to measure TSH in healthy people over the age of 50 and in people with family history of autoimmune thyroid disease. But to measure it in everybody, I don't think that's standard procedure yet. She was first. Uh, We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to answer that question at the end. Yeah, I have a slide, several slides on that. Yeah. I think part of the problem is the insurance company. Here's, there's not a lot of good reason to test for it. That is correct. Any time yeah. they will deny mm -hmm. the authorization. That is true. That is true. And family history is often not a good reason for your insurance company to pay for the test. But the test is, shouldn't be that expensive. Yeah, somebody had a question back there. Okay, so that speaks, so birth control pills. Okay, so birth control. Yeah, well, birth control pills, number one, have been associated, they can be a precipitating event for autoimmune thyroid disease. But that's not what your doctor, the, the mistake is that birth control pills raise the thyroxin level artificially. Okay, so you can, if you see the thyroxin level is typically elevated in somebody on a birth control pill because of an artifact of what the birth control pill does. It does not cause an over, but it can precipitate an overproducing thyroid, but in the average person who isn't prone to develop an overproducing thyroid, it always raises the thyroxin level, but it's an artifact of the test. It has to do with the way the birth control pill raises a binding protein that binds up the thyroxin, and that's not the biologically relevant fraction. So you can be fooled in people on birth control pills. Yeah. So back to treating hypothyroidism, endocrinologists found that thyroxine worked as well or better than thyroid extract, and so, but even when, but even thyroxine, like thyroid extract, doesn't solve every person's symptoms. So here's a, uh, a paper that was published about 10 years ago on well-being and patients on adequate doses of levothyroxine or thyroxine, adequate meaning their TSH level is between 0.5 and 4.0. And the control patients who aren't being treated had a 25% chance of having psychological distress and the patients 32%. So it's a little higher. It is a little higher. And so this has led to a resurgence of thyroid extract use, because there are these proponents. I don't know if anybody in the audience feels this way. We're going to get into this, that we really shouldn't be using thyroxine. We should be going back to using th animal thyroid extract. Yeah, how many feel this way? OK. OK, we got, OK. We're going to get into this. <laughs> Here's why you feel passionately about this issue, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, OK? One, okay, it's better because it's both T4 and T3, right? 
Yes, okay. And both are made by a healthy thyroid, and you need both, right? Yeah. Okay. And, hey, there's other stuff in there that you're missing. When somebody takes out your thyroid or destroys it with radioactive iodine, there's other stuff in thyroid extract that, you know, may, may, maybe you need this. Of course, there are no data for this, and there are data against it. There are scientific data against it, but there's the anecdotal data for it. No question. No question. Now, the other, other proponents say, hey, it's natural. You know, even though it still ends up in a factory, it's natural to the, you know, it's a natural product. But it's natural to pigs or cows. Okay. And then the other thing that many proponents feel, and I don't know if you feel this way as well. Do you feel this way? It. You're it. Okay. Well, here's the problem that the endocrinologists have with this, okay? Number one, um, maybe TSH isn't the right measure. Maybe you're right. We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. Definitely people feel better. But is it just the stimulant effect? Are you using it as a pharmacologic substance? Well, this is the question. Is it being used as a you know, when we treat people with hormones to replace what's missing with what's missing, we like to do it to normality. And if we do it excessively, are we just using it now as a drug and not a hormone replacement? Similar to just, you know, getting a jolt of caffeine in the morning. And are you just benefiting because it's over-treatment and you might get the same benefit from just thyroxin alone when over-treated? No. I, there's no question that you, you're not alone. Okay, well, here's... <laughs> okay, now here's the rub. Okay, here's the rub. Okay, here's the rub right here. The risk. Am I beyond? Okay, no more questions for a little while. Okay. The rub is that when you have an overfunctioning thyroid, when you have too much thyroid hormone in your blood to the point where your TSH is suppressed, we start seeing risks. So this is back to up to date. So this is a list of the risks from today's up to date by Doug Ross, Mass General Endocrinologist. One, decreased bone density. Now, I'm not a believer in bone density being an accurate measure of bone strength. I know it's a popular uh, test to do, and particularly menopausal women, but in my opinion, it's a highly inaccurate test. So I don't really use this as a reason to not be on extra thyroid hormone. However, if you measure something called bone turnover, biochemically, you have more rapid bone turnover, and that means you're going to be losing more bone than you ordinarily would, and maybe that leads to fracture. But notice, Dr. Ross doesn't put down increased risk of fracture because there are no data that it actually increases risk of fracture. So these are surrogate markers. On the other hand, atrial fibrillation is a real problem. Atrial fibrillation, the atria are the top part of the heart, the ventricles are the bottom part of the heart, the atria starts the ball rolling, pumps blood into the bottom part, the ventricles, the blood ventricles then pump that blood out to the systemic circulation, and atrial fibrillation this is the atrial beat. Here's the ventricular beat. No more atrial beat. And now the ventricles beat irregularly. So now you have atria that are kind of doing that. And when they do that, you get blood clots along the wall. And that can break off, go to the ventricle, cause stroke. Second, as you age, you need your atria to kick the blood in. It becomes more and more important as you age. And this is a risk factor for heart failure. Now, there's no question in our literature that if, that if you have subclinical hyperthyroidism, you're on enough thyroid hormone, you feel well, but your TSH is suppressed, that's the definition. You don't look like you have an overfunctioning thyroid anymore, but the TSH is suppressed. If it's suppressed to less than 0.1 and you're over the age of 60, your risk of atrial fibrillation goes up from your baseline risk of 10% to 30%. That's enormous. And even if it's between 0.1 and 0.4, it's doubling the risk. And just this, I found this paper fascinating 
These are normal people. These aren't people on thyroid hormone. These aren't people with an over underfunctioning thyroid. These are normal people, right? This is a Rotterdam study, normal people, and they just took normal people, and if you have a normal TSH between 0.4 and 1, even you're at increased risk of developing naturally atrial fibrillation. So I think that's a real problem, and the real reason not to be on an excessive dose, even if it's making you feel better. But everybody's different, and you know, you gotta take the, you get, it, this has to be explained to people, and then you take the risk for the benefit. And that's your choice, and that's anybody's choice. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, it's Dr. Smith's fault. <laughs> so then the other issue is, is the reason why you don't have relief of symptoms when your TSH is normalized is because the symptoms are not specific. Are you suffering from something else, and is this placebo effect? Do we all know what placebo effect is? Now, placebo is real, because you can demonstrate real physiologic changes in people from giving them inert substances. You give somebody with asthma an inhaler that has nothing in it, and you can demonstrate improved lung function. So there's a very big mind-body mind connection. Is it really true that this combination of T4 and T3 is more effective for symptom relief? Uh, what about when it's adjusted to a normal TSH? What about just taking the combination and having a normal TSH? Well, we haven't been able to show it. That's the problem. There was one paper published 12 years ago from Slovenia, very small numbers of people. It created a big stir in the New England Journal of Medicine. Not quite sure how it got published there, it was such a poor study. And it did show improvement, but all the subsequent studies, not effective. So despite your claim, there are no controlled clinical trials, and we remain unconvinced as a group. But Here's the problem, heterogeneity in treatment effects in clinical trials. Just because we can't demonstrate it, maybe 10% of people benefit. Well, you're not gonna see those 10% in a clinical trial. They're gonna be buried by the other 90%. So my practice is to do this. This is my practice, contrary to guidelines and um, what other endocrinologists in Boston would feel about this. My approach is an empirical trial, meaning we do an experiment of one in you. And we adjust it to get the TSH around 1.0 because I'm concerned about these data that even between 0.4 and 1.0 could be increasing risk of atrial fibrillation. Uh, but everything's negotiable. If you feel better at 0.4 and you're willing to take that slightly increased risk, so be it. I'm opposed to less than 0.1. That I'm not comfortable with. Okay, so we do an empirical trial of one to see if you feel better. If you feel better, fine. If you don't, you go back to T4 alone. Now, this is not the current wisdom. You must know that. So this is from the Rural College of Physicians. What we really should be doing is doing a blood test, and the only scientifically proven way of treating the condition is by topping up a patient's natural thyroxine level with synthetic thyroxine. Back to up-to-date, Dr. Ross, treatment of choice for correction is thyroxine. The vast majority of patients with hypothyroidism, we suggest not, those are his caps, not mine, I didn't change the slide, his caps, not using combination T4, but my practice is to try it in an individual person. He also says that you should remain on the same brand because if you switch brands, you change the absorption characteristic of the brand, and, and if we change, sometimes just a few percent change in dose alters the TSH level. So you want to be on branded products. And he's saying get it between 0.5 and 5.0. I don't quite agree with the 5.0, and here's why. If you walk in the door with a nodular thyroid and an underfunctioning thyroid, and you have a nodule, that nodule is more likely to be a cancer if your TSH is above 5 than if your TSH is 1. So that, you, you can infer from that, one in, can infer possibly from that, doesn't prove that an elevated TSH raises your risk of getting thyroid cancer, but that's the inference. And there's biological plausibility for that in animal models. And there's increasing evidence that elevated TSH levels are implicated in promoting growth of thyroid cancer. You need the initiator, which is radioactive iodine or radiation, and then you need the promoter. Now, if you get radioactive iodine to destroy your thyroid completely, 
you don't get thyroid cancer because the thyroid's gone. But if you get a small amount, as we are all exposed to, any of us who grew up in the 1950s have been exposed to radioactive iodine, um, and subsequently, uh, we're, we get the initiator, and then the elevated TSH promotes the growth of the cancer. So there's biological plausibility to not titrating the dose of thyroid hormone to get the TSH to five, but rather down to one. Now that said, on the other side of the coin, you know, all data are provisional. Tomorrow somebody could publish, you know, what we know today, this is what Fuller Albright said, famous endocrinologist at the Mass General 63 years ago. He said, what's well, true today will turn out to be half true tomorrow. Here's a, here's a, a longevity study, okay? The lower your TSH and the higher your thyroxin level, the highest chance of dying. And we have data now, this answers your question, on age-related normality. So this is from a national health and nutrition survey that's going on year after year after year. And you can see that the proportion of people with a TSH above four or five rises as we age, and that's associated with longevity. And so this is later data. This was just published a few months ago. Maybe the normal range, once you're above the age of 80 or 70, should go up to seven. Maybe the upper limit of normal is really seven. So competing influences, competing data. No right answer. Uh, how to take your levothyroxine just to end. You want to absorb the right way. So you take it at least a half hour. The books say an hour. I find a half hour is probably sufficient. Before you eat, you can't drink coffee with it. You can't take it with calcium iron. If you skip a pill, you need to double up the next day because, again, we change the dose by a pill a month. Yeah? And so in some patients, that makes a change. If you miss three pills, you take four pills the next day, contrary to what the pharmacy printout says. I know the pharmacy printout says not to double up. It's completely wrong. Don't take it with drugs that interfere with the absorption. And soy, I didn't put this on the slide, soy, soy is a phytate. It takes thyroid hormone out of your gut. There's a recirculation of thyroid hormone in our body. We secrete it in the liver. It goes into the gut. It gets reabsorbed. This is normals and people on thyroid hormone. So if you eat a lot of soy, my thyroid can respond and make extra thyroid hormone. Yours can't if it's been destroyed by your doctor iatrogenically. You can't make enough to, to replace the amount that's being taken out of your gut by the soy. So you have to keep your soy intake steady or you can never get the thyroid level right and steady. If it looks like you need more than 0.75 micrograms per pound, you're probably on something that's screwing up the absorption or you have some malabsorption problem. Often it's celiac disease, as Dr. Smith pointed out. It's common to have other autoimmune conditions. So you could have celiac disease causing selective, you could be totally asymptomatic, no symptoms, and just have selective malabsorption of thyroxin, and it drives up your thyroid hormone dose requirement. Other drugs do it too. Probably these proton pump inhibitors that are very popular these days to reduce acid production, they do it too. And some people need to crush the tablet, I don't know why, to really get it absorbed right. And to overcome this, there is a new product on the market. I have no stake in this company. It was a Swiss company. It's been around in Switzerland for quite a while. And it's a gel cap. And this may overcome some of the absorption problems from taking thyroxine with coffee, maybe not with food, but with coffee, and maybe these proton pump inhibitor issues with lowered acidic production, which is required for thyroxine absorption. Sorry I ran late. I'm going to be around for the weekend. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Smith, you don't want me to take questions now? You're the boss. You're not the boss of me, Terry. <laughs>